Hello, thank you for joining me tonight. I am Lauren Lembo, and I will be talking about an archaeological site that was identified in 2017 during a phase one and two archaeological survey and was investigated further during a phase three data recovery completed in 2019. I hope to follow up with an article for the ASNJ in the not too distant future. It's titled Terrace Habitation from the Archaic Through Woodland, a stratified prehistoric site within New Jersey's intercoastal plain, and it's Locus One of the Avalon Old Bridge prehistoric site. This site is situated on a sliver of terrace adjacent to a tributary of Deep Run within the Lower Raritan River watershed. The site is comprised of three loci, of which one, Locus One, down towards the bottom, uh, yielded deeply buried, dense artifact deposits and features. Locus One formed as a result of repeated occupations related to the procurement of animal and plant resources, with diagnostic artifacts spanning the early archaic through late woodland periods. A tributary of Deep Run is to the east and southeast of Locus One. So in this vicinity is where our site is located. And a residential development is located to the west and the southwest. The site sits adjacent to wooded wetlands on a number of sides. Historically, the land within and surrounding the site remained wooded until more recent development began to take place. It was not subject to historic or, or modern agricultural practices. The soils are sandy and vary somewhat in depth and color from north to south along the terrace. Within the larger landscape of New Jersey, this particular section of the state is located at a geographical and cultural border. It's not far from the boundary of where the last glacial ice sheet once stood, and the land on which the site is located straddles the former territories of two indigenous tribes, the Lenni Lenape to the south and the Munsee Lenape to the north. Bear in mind these territories likely reflect more recent prehistory through contact period, and this mapping project is a work in progress by Native Land Digital, an indigenous-led nonprofit that is working to render former native land territories on a nearly global scale. I think it's important to remember that even though um, this site is located in a town, in a state, in a country, that the people whose lives I speak of this evening that once inhabited this land did so long before our present day boundaries existed. And it's important to acknowledge that this was once their land. And this is just a zoomed out view of the northeastern part of the United States and Canada, just to show the scale and complexity of this pretty incredible project. So I encourage you to check out the links provided. And to visualize prehistory as we know it in this region, this is a timeline, not to scale, showing the general progression of periods of time. So think early archaic about 10,000 years ago and woodland period, early woodland about 3,000 years ago. A number of periods in prehistory seem to be represented within this small piece of land encompassing Locus One of the site. And here is Locus One during different times of the year, the phase one and two survey on the left and a photo from the phase three survey on the right. Note modern disturbance is comprised of a meandering pedestrian trail used by residents of the nearby development and also some sporadic small brush piles thrown over yard fences in some isolated areas. Root matter was encountered within the soil stratigraphy to varying degrees throughout the site locus. Excavations yielded over 5,000 artifacts including prehistoric ceramics, firecracked rock, thermally altered rock, debitage, and a variety of tools which will be touched upon later. Several ecofacts were also recovered, including charcoal, calcine bone, indeterminate minerals, and one fossil. The highest concentration of artifacts recovered was from the B2 horizon, followed by the B1 horizon. And some artifacts were even recovered as low in the profile as 
in the BC Horizon interface. The strategic stratigraphy in the site reflects a predominant, predominantly natural soil profile um, that's undisturbed by post-depositional -depo human activity, which is really rare in this region. Um, so no construction related fills and no plowing, no plow zone. A total of 595 prehistoric ceramic fragments were recovered during excavations, 92% of which were recovered from the B1 horizon. 11 different temper categories were identified with decoration ranging from smooth to cord marked, incised, pinched, and possibly impressed. Unfortunately, there are a few sizable mendable fragments, most of which were considerably fragmented and unfortunately residue was also lacking. Even so, there was considerable variety in vessels represented. Evidence of fire clouding or smudging may suggest some of the vessels were used in cooking, and small rimmed vessels may have been used for temporary storage and transportation of procured items. Um, this is a great image of Nora Thompson Dean and also one taken by Susan McClellan Playstead, um, two women keeping Lenape cooking practices alive. The highest concentration of ceramics were recovered from the southern portion of the site locus, so kind of up towards the right of your screen, um, which may indicate a preferred discard area for shattered pots, might reflect a particular, particular activity area, or indicate there was more intensive use there by maybe middle to late woodland groups as compared to other portions of the site. It should be noted that this is also where deep run tributary changes course. So that might be a factor also. Um, this shows woodland distribution, this rendering, um, and it's represented by ceramics and also the only exclusively woodland period diagnostic tool recovered from Locus One, which was a Jasper Jacks Reef pentagonal type projectile point. And it was recovered from the B1 horizon of excavation unit 17 at a depth overlapping feature one, which I will discuss now. So 17 is over here, if you can see my cursor. Um, and within that EU and EU4 adjacent to it, we're exposed to further identify feature one, which was present within the lower portion of the B1 horizon and yielded a calibrated date generally corresponding with the later part of the middle woodland period to the beginning of the late woodland period. Feature one contained one diagnostic artifact comprised of a shell-tempered ceramic fragment. Although there were not many features identified at Locus One, um, which is typical of a procurement site, three out of four of the features um, indicate some degree of fire use. And the features on this graphic are indicated by the yellow squares. So there's sort of clustered to the south portion of the site locus, but there's also one up to the north as well. And um, although intact features were not numerous, uh, fire cracked rock and thermally altered rock were found across the landform and accounted for a whopping 47% of the total artifact assemblage. A near equal amount was recovered in the B1 horizon and the B2 horizon. And this is a good time to point out um, why differentiating between the B1 horizon and the B2 horizon is so important for this particular site. And it's because Locus 1 of the Avalon Old Bridge Prehistoric Site is considered culturally stratified um, with an evident temporal distinction between artifact deposits identified in the B1 horizon versus the B2 horizon. Although many of the tools recovered from the site are non-diagnostic or have use histories spanning the archaic through woodland, like converging stem points, um, strictly archaic period tool types were recovered from the B2 horizon, whereas the B1 horizon yielded nearly all of the ceramics, a Jack's Reef point, and also yielded two woodland period radiocarbon dates from two intact shallow pit features. Unfortunately, the B2 horizon contained um, a couple artifact clusters, but no intact features. Um, and one general context charcoal sample submitted as a Hail Mary, unfortunately did not yield a reliable date, which is a little disappointing, but it is what it is. Um, and to further visualize the vertical distribution of artifacts, these are profile cross sections taken from throughout Locus One, 
And mind you, the depth of strata varied between the northern and the southern portions of the landform with varying degrees of root disturbance. So minor bioturbation was a factor in some areas. Um, which moves us to the geomorphological assessment conducted by John Steitler, which determined that steady biomantle formation through time allowed for stratigraphic preservation of artifact deposits and that vertical distinctions of the chrono chronology of the site use are intact. So large scale alluvial or colluvial deposition during the Holocene was not considered to be a factor in site burial at Locus 1. Small scale bioturbators such as ants carried particles of sand steadily through time from the lower depths of the soil profile within fluvial Pleistocene soils and brought them upwards to the ground surface. Um, the archeological data and coupled with the geomorphology geomorph strongly suggests that the ar archaic period um, is represented within the approximate 1.5 foot thick B2 horizon particularly within the lower and middle portions, whereas the woodland period repre is represented within the B1 horizon, defined by absolute dating, and also by comparisons of diagnostic artifacts between contexts. So both diagnostic and non-diagnostic tools were recovered across the landform, 108 in total, and over 73% 73, 73 of the tools were recovered from the B2 horizon. And lithic debitage was pretty much equally widespread across the site locus, um, accounting for over 1,800 pieces in total, comprised mostly of argillite, followed by chert, jasper, siltstone, quartz, and very sparse quantities of quartzite, crystal quartz, and chalcedony. Over 76% of debitage was recovered from the B2 horizon. Tools include utilized flakes, retouched and incised flakes, scrapers, two atlatl weight or banner stone fragments, expedient cobble to tools and hammer stones, drills, projectile points, a micro tool, preform, unifaces, bifaces, tested cobbles and pebbles, and several cores. These photos show just a small sample of the artifacts recovered over three phases of survey. Expedient cobble tools and hammer stones were made exclusively from quartzite, and many of them were found in a cluster within the B2 horizon designated as feature three. The atlatl weight or banner, banner stone fragments were made of banded slate and schist. The schist one is the one that's shown on the left of the screen. Uh, they would have acted as counterbalances in spear throwing, and interestingly, the one on the left appears to have been fractured, possibly during use, and was subsequently redrilled and repurposed. Its use after being re retooled may have been more ceremonial than functional, but somewhat indeterminate. Classifications for projectile point types, as indicated by morphological characteristics, include lax waxen straight and converging stem, Bear Island, Poplar Island, Rossville, Brewerton side notched, Kittatinny, Lehigh Cohen's Crispin Broadspear, Genesee, Kirk like stemmed, Orient Fishtail, and Jack's Reef Pentagonal. Rhyolite material used to produce two of three recovered Kirk like stem projectile points was likely derived from a source in New England, and they are shown on the bottom right of the screen, three Kirk-like stemmed points, one of which is chert. Um, expedient flake tools, such as retouch flakes, utilized flakes, and scrapers were made from mostly argillite, followed by chert, jasper, a metasedimentary material, quartzite, and silstone. A single preform was recovered, made from argillite, and bifaces, which exhibit various stages of tool manufacture and maintenance, were made predominantly of argillite as well. The tools diagnostic of the archaic period were found across the site locus, and this rendering um, does not include converging stem points or types that also have possible woodland period associations. 
Unfortunately, protein residue analysis conducted on two projectile points did not yield positive results. However, other specialized analyses were more promising. Microware analysis on a chert scraper indicated use in skinning fresh hide or butchering meat and bone. A lack of hafting traces suggests it may have been handheld and used for only a brief period of time. Starch grain analysis was conducted on one hammerstone recovered from feature three mentioned a little bit earlier and an expedient cobble tool that was recovered from the B1 horizon. Both artifact samples contain starches observed in roots, tubers, rhizomes, seeds, and most commonly associated with grass seeds. The analysis concluded that both tools were used to grind grass seeds, um, possibly cool season grasses such as wild wheat grass, wide grass, um, and or oat grass, the starches of which are similar in shape to cultivated wheat, rye, and oat seeds. Additionally, a starch grain found on the expedient cobble tool, which is the one shown on the bottom of the pictures, um, also demonstrated, in addition to the grass seeds, um, starches that were similar in shape to um, a member of the, the, the lily family. So this not only indicates that plant processing activities were occurring within the southern portion of the site locus, but also based on intrasite comparisons, um, indicates similar plant resources were being procured over periods of time at Lucas One. So spanning the archaic and woodland periods, which is pretty interesting with the addition of the lily family um, as evidenced by the woodland period um, context that the one cobble tool was found in. So site-wide data and comparative regional data suggest Locus One is likely a procurement area occupied and revisited repeatedly over a long duration of time. However, the archeological surveys were only able to per peripherally investigate this landform, a majority of which had been extensively altered by 20th century residential development, as you can see here. So the site locus is right here, and then all of this was um, constructed in about the 1980s. So, um, and there was no survey done for that development. So, so who knows? It, it's gonna be a, an unanswered question for all time. Um, it's probable that the site once extended to the south into where this reg residential development now stands um, and could have been comprised of larger and more complex encampment areas with additional activity and processing areas as well. Regionally, comparisons can be made with sites further south in the coastal plain, such as the Sorbello One site, which also yielded evidence for wetland plant processing, wetland plant being the, the lily family. Um, in other ways, Locus One of the Avalon Old Bridge prehistoric site does not ascribe to typically observed trends. Um, so for instance, quartzite does not appear to be a preferred material for fire-related activities. Um, and with the exception of a few exotic lithic materials used particularly for archaic and transitional period tools, the site largely communicates a preference for very local um, lithic materials within the coastal plain and also some Piedmont lithic materials, such as the heavy emphasis on argillite. And despite a lack of reliable absolute dating from within the B2 horizon, comparisons of diagnostic artifacts between contexts and in relation to dated contexts of the B1 horizon informs the chronology of the site formation processes. The geomorphological assessment of Locus One further supports the stratigraphic layering of the site through the gradual processes of biomantle formation caused by small scale bioturbators, allowing for greater vertical and horizontal preservation as opposed to gross bioturbation. Site data collected from Locus One indicates that the middle to late archaic periods are likely represented within the middle to lower portions of the B2 horizon with a late archaic to early woodland association for the upper portion of the B2 horizon. 
And the B1 horizon, based on absolute dating, is associated with the middle to late woodland. Temporal associations within locus one draw from intracite comparisons and analysis of vertical distribution of diagnostic artifacts guided by the results of the geomorphological assessment and also um, paying consideration to regional radiocarbon assays for comparative assemblages. There were a number of people that assisted with multiple aspects of this archeological project and too many to list in detail to do everyone justice, but just a big thanks to all present and former RGA staff and crew who were involved and also to Jack Creston, Justine McKnight, John Steitler, Richard Yerkes, and Paleo Research Institute, who helped with specialized analyses and just um, sort of informal consultations of some of the artifacts that were found. And also a thanks to the East Brunswick Museum um, for allowing me to view their collection of prehistoric ceramics to make some cross comparisons with what we were finding at Locus One. And thank you to the Archaeological Society of New Jersey for inviting me as a speaker. It was a pleasure sharing some aspects of this interesting site with you. And if you have any questions, please reach out and I will do my best to answer them. Thank you.